I have to be on a plane tonight. Tonight. I'm not even done packing yet. So why am I getting in my car right now? Because Spider-Verse comes out today, motherfucker. I have my priorities in order. My flight leaves at 10, this movie is at four. I have to drive two hours to get to the airport and I'm not done packing yet. That's how excited I am for this movie. I'm gonna tell y'all what I think about it once I get out of it, but I, I'm, I'm fucking hyped. All right, it is now nearly 12 hours later and I am in a completely different state, so let's talk about it. I was not fucking kidding when I said I needed to go. Oh, and if you're roughly in the Watertown, New York area, go pick up your tickets to NoCoCon. Use code PANDARED for a discount. Please make it worth my while to fly to the other side of the fucking country. Also justify to the fucking Comic-Con that paid for it, please. All right, all right, across the Spider-Verse, let's talk about it. I have been actively debating since I left the movie theater uh, if, if Across the Spider-Verse is better than Into the Spider-Verse, which is a big fucking task. Into the Spider-Verse is and has been my absolute favorite comic book movie of all time since it came out. Oh, look, an unattended gate that doesn't have a flight coming in for a couple hours. Anyway, the fact that Across the Spider-Verse even gets close to it is absolutely remarkable. And I'm pretty confident in saying that it either shares a spot or overtakes Into the Spider-Verse. It feels like a nice and proper sequel. Like, it expands on shit that happened in the first movie. It's not just a completely new story. Which I kind of thought it was going to be with all of the new characters and the new location that was being added. I genuinely wasn't really sure if they were going to even address anything that happened in the first movie. Or if they were, if it was just going to be the fact that characters knew each other. And it's definitely a lot more than that. Animation is absolutely insane. They add even more styles and, and going to different worlds to actually see the different animation styles that those worlds have is incredible. I will say they do get a little reference happy. I found it to be a little grating. Uh, Scarlet didn't really mind it. Anybody I've heard talking about this movie doesn't really mind it. I, it. It might just be a me thing. Also, they curse a couple of times in this movie, like more times than I thought that they were going to. Like, I legit leaned over to Scarlet a couple of times like, hey, what, what's this movie rated? I thought this was a kid's movie. <laughs> we'll say, taking into account that this is a part one of a two-part series, I feel like it's gonna get even greater when it's combined with its second half. The reason I'm not ranting and raving about how it's so much better than Into the Spider-Verse is just because I, it, it, does, it does end on a cliffhanger. There are things that aren't resolved, and Into the Spider-Verse did tell a complete story from beginning to end. However, it should tell you how good it is, specifically on the fact that even though it is just a part one of a two-part series, it still almost overtakes Spy Into the Spider-Verse, if not already overtakes it. Go see this movie. In theaters, preferably. Like, now. Make a video about it. Tag Sony and it to get me to the next fucking premiere. And if you're on the East Coast, come see me at NokuCon this weekend. Alright, enough feeling. I got a six-hour layover to get to and nothing to do during it. I'll see y'all when I land in New York. Alright, NokuCon is officially over. It's time to film all of the things that I got so that I can write it off on my tag. I mean, thank the people who gave them to me. I had a returning fan give me an entire bag full of Piggly Wiggly goodies. That Venom Pop guy gave me a Red Hood box for the pop that he gave me last time. It even has a sticker that says TikTok Creator Exclusive. That is just so fucking cool. Studio Cadco, which gave me my Stolen Bones box from last time, gave me a little Warlock sticker. It's even got a goddamn tentacle on it. That's fucking perfect. And they had like a little gumball machine on their table that had dice in it and somehow I ended up getting a d20 that is my exact color scheme look at the it's gray and bright red how is that even possible I was given a literal entire bag of Robin comics yes they are all Robin comics the con itself gave us uh, our signs that had our faces on them this one has a bit of a funny story behind it when I sent in my picture like the one that they were gonna be using in advertisements the picture that I sent apparently cut off a little bit of the top of my head and they photoshopped it back on but the problem is that they didn't like have a reference picture of where it was supposed to go so I lovingly call this the Panda Mega Mind poster. Just for reference, so people don't tell me that yes, your head's actually that big. I I can see them both. Returning fan webcam Nick gave me this cool ass little poster that he drew. This as a sort of thank you for the drawings that I did the drink and draw forum last year. He also bought me this Joker poster by an artist named Matt Flint, who was also at the con. And then Matt Flint himself gave me a comic from the place where he worked, which is the Pfizer sponsored Avengers comic. Yes, Pfizer as in the vaccine people. And then because I know absolutely everybody is going to ask. Yes, they gave me another one. Shout out to Star Ford Sabres for giving me literally another fucking lightsaber. I don't know how they keep getting brighter. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Volume control activated. Volume adjust. That's better.
Now it's loud as shit and bright as shit. And this time they also gave me one for Panda Scarlet. This one is considerably louder than mine. But just look at that hilt though, right? That is cool as shit. I was also very specially given four water bottles by my Twitch crew. I was given this awesome bracelet by one of my patrons. Webcam Nick also gave me the Death of Jason Todd comic. One of the vendors gave me Marvel and DC coasters for my house. And finally, I was actually given two full manila envelopes worth of fan arts from another regular of mine. Y'all don't fuck around when it comes to cons. This is more shit than my old P.O. Box hauls, good God. Speaking of which, remember my P.O. Box. I want to do more P.O. Box hauls, damn it. All right, I got to figure out a way to get this all into my bag, so I'm going to let y'all go. Thank you to everybody at NoCoCon for showing out, and you guys have a nice night. All right, so I'm back from NoCoCon, and I am working on my newest episode of the Comic Book Book Club, and I realized something. Also, if you wonder why I'm ripping off Straw Hat here, last time I went on a walk and filmed the video, I used a voice changer to cover up for the fact that it's windy as fuck out here, and uh, nobody really liked that, so I'm gonna do this now. Anyways, there is a point in the video where I'm doing a everything you need to know before you read Batman Year One. And one of those things is, is that Batman Year One is supposed to be the post-Crisis on Infinite Earths new origin for Batman. For any of you that don't speak nerd, that means after DC's first big reboot, Batman Year One was supposed to be Batman's new, essentially, origin story. It doesn't actually tell his origin story, it's just the first year of him operating as Batman, but th th you get the point. I'm gonna see if my beard doesn't fuck up the microphone here. Anyway. In this section, I was saying that this story operates as Batman's origin story since that reboot and until DC's next big reboot. Because as everybody always jokes, DC reboots their universe all the fucking time, right? That's a super common joke amongst comic book fans, that DC always reboots their universe and Marvel never does. But then I looked into it. DC has only ever full send rebooted their universe twice. Crisis on Infinite Earths and Flashpoint. Every single other crisis that DC has had only dealt with either the multiverse or the timeline. You know, like Marvel is doing right now. Case in point, Crisis on Infinite Earths. There's a multiverse, we don't want that anymore. They can pack it down into one universe, big reboot, totally makes sense. Universe has been rebooted, everybody needs new origins, let's do all of that. Second big event, also known as Zero Hour or Crisis in Time. Literally just cleaning up that single timeline that they now have. This Crisis on Infinite Earths, if anybody doesn't know what happens there, is essentially like the one who remains in Marvel making just one timeline out of a multiverse. That's what it was. Zero Hour was going through that timeline and making it make more sense. That brings us to Infinite Crisis. What does that do? Not a reboot, literally just makes a multiverse again. Could explain every single DC crisis by literally just watching Loki and going, yeah, it's like that. Brings us to Final Crisis, also not a reboot. In the grand scheme of things, the only thing the Final Crisis really did was bring back Barry Allen and kill Batman for a year. After that, it's just Flashpoint, which didn't even start live as a reboot comic. It's literally just a Flash story that when DC editorial saw it, they went, you know what, that, uh, we wanted to work Vertigo in, this is a really good way to do that, so let's just make it Barry's fault. In the first reboot, he's responsible for basically saving the universe. The second, he's single-handedly responsible for wiping out half of the characters, erasing everybody's history, and making sure that half of the characters don't even fucking exist anymore. They retcon that and reboot to be Dr. Manhattan's fault. Who gives a sh- You could technically count Rebirth, but I don't even care. Because what Rebirth does is essentially try and make Flashpoint not a reboot. Technically classifies it as a retcon. For all those counting at home, that's two reboots. Tote. It's just hilarious to think about as a DC fan. I don't know, just something fun to think about. Okay, so yesterday I made a video talking about how DC has ever really only had two universal reboots. And in response to that video, I got a good couple of comments. And most of them can be sorted into three categories. The first being this one, how many reboots does Marvel have? The second one being if DC only has two reboots, one being Crisis on Infinite Earths and the other being Flashpoint, then what the hell was the new 52? And the third one being a little less clean, like it's less clean cut to explain. So the, the third one is essentially... Yes, DC has only had two universal start from scratch reboots, but every crisis affects the universe by rebooting certain things. And I want to argue all of them. Well, not argue, I, I want to talk about all of them. So first one, how many reboots does Marvel have? Technically two, and even then, it's not super clean. Marvel has a sliding time scale. Essentially, they update events every couple of years so that their characters don't become outdated. Like the war that a character will fight in will update every couple of years if it's essential to their backstory. The Punisher went from fighting in Nam to fighting in Afghanistan to fighting in Iraq. It's, it, it's just kind of updates the longer that the character exists. And the two actual reboots that you could say that they have were the two Secret Wars. However, the first Secret Wars, at least to my knowledge, didn't 
really reboot anything, like start anything new. It just came back with a new baseline, like Peter Parker's in the black suit now, and, and a couple of characters are, are sort slightly different or dead, that sort of thing. They tried to have a reboot in the 90s called Heroes Reborn that was helmed by Rob Liefeld, but uh, no one really liked that for pretty obvious reasons. But both that and the first Secret War, the, the characters still have their original timeline. Like, they didn't need to give them new origins. They tried in Heroes Reborn, but then it turned out that was an alternate dimension. They retconned that out of the picture. Secret Wars did not restart anybody's timeline and, and have to retell everybody's origin. Marvel tends to do that on a more character-by-character -character basis. They've done it for Spider-Man a couple of times. Uh, they've done it for Wolverine a couple of times. But there's no, like, big universal everybody gets new origins sort of reboot. The only closest thing that they have to that is Secret Wars 2, where they mashed together the Ultimates universe and the 616 universe. And even then, it's really not a reboot. They don't start everybody fresh, they don't give everybody new origins, they don't have to re-explain everybody's timeline, everybody knows each other, everybody has known each other, all the stories that have existed for years have still existed. Nobody's older, nobody's younger, it's everyone is still them, but now their universes exist in the same place. Again, not a reboot, just a restructuring. Nobody got reset. Nobody has to tell their stories anew. Their stories existed exactly how they existed, including the fact that there was a giant event where everybody's universes got merged. I'm just now realizing that I have only covered one question in this video. I'm gonna make a part two with the second question, because it's a lot easier. I'm sure you're all tired of hearing about it by now, but last weekend I went to NokoCon in Watertown, New York. And there were a couple of panels that I did while I was there. The first was as a guest on Adventures in Arcadia's panel, where we did a live roll for sandwich. The sandwich we created was on bread made of s'mores pop-tarts. It contained turkey, Velveeta cheese, wasabi, slossa, don't add it, apparently it's mustard relish, I don't fucking know, artichoke hearts, and snow peas. This is what it looked like. And before you even attempt to ask me, yes, it was fucking disgusting! It was weirdly sweet and completely soft, and I hated it! However, the second panel that I did was a live regrettable superhero of the week. We covered two superheroes, and instead of rolling for superheroes this week, I think I'm just gonna cover the ones I did at the panel. Before I, you know, completely forget that I did them at the panel. I have a history of that. Anyway, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I pick one character out random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes, and then I run them the fuck down. It's a little less than random today, but let's get into it. One of the characters that we covered, I shit you not, was named... 7-Eleven. Let that sink in for a minute. His name is 7-Eleven. He was invented in 1941. No, he has nothing to do with the convenience store. Somehow it's dumber than that. 7-Eleven was created by George Brenner in Police Comics number one of Quality Comics in August of 1941. George Brenner is also responsible for creating The Clock, who was the first masked hero in comics ever, which is just kind of a, a, a neat little thing. I thought that was cool. 7-Eleven's real name is Attorney Daniel Dice. Daniel is the best friend in the entire world. Why do I say that? Well, that's because Daniel does a favor for his friend Jacob Horn. You see, Jacob is about to go to jail for life. Why is he gonna go to jail for life? Who fucking knows? They don't sentence you to life in prison for small shit, though. Anyway, Jacob has a pregnant wife who's about to give birth. So here's the favor that Daniel's gonna do for him. He is going to confess to all of Jacob's crimes, therefore being sent to prison for life in his stead, so that Jacob can be there for the birth of his child. And then after that, Jacob will then come back, reconfess to the crimes, and trade spaces with Daniel. How much faith do you have to have in a man to just honor system that shit? Anyway, the plan goes off without a hitch, Daniel landing behind bars and Jacob being out on the outside. However, when Jacob is driving back to reconfess, he gets into a fatal car accident and dies, leaving Daniel behind bars forever. So what does Daniel do? The only reasonable thing, tunnels his way out and becomes a superhero. With the ironclad defense that he can't be 7-Eleven because he's actually behind bars. Because he crawls back into his cell at the end of every night. Well, where does the name come from, you might ask? That's his cell number! This is almost as bad as Tim Drake calling himself Drake. Am I really gonna have to make a part two for this? Oh my god. Well, here's your hook for part two. Somehow this guy got a seal of approval. Come back for the next one to learn why. This is a part two to a regrettable superhero that I already did. So if you haven't seen it already, go back and watch it. So why the hell did I give 7-Eleven a panda seal of approval? This dude's entire shtick is that he sneaks out of his life in prison sentence to go and be a superhero and then climbs back into his cell at the end of the day so that he has the 
perfect excuse as to why he's not the superhero. It's like if the Green Hornet took it one step too far. Well, the reason that I gave him a panda seal of approval is because I genuinely think this character could come back as a Batman villain. Why specifically a Batman villain? Because his arch nemesis in his own book is a character named Brickbat. This is Brickbat. You can't tell me that's not just Batman in the Riddler's suit. His whole deal is that he threw bricks at people. Genuinely, that's it. They'd be filled with like poison gas sometimes, but he threw bricks at people and that that's his whole deal. So can you imagine if 7-Eleven is simply a insane person from Arkham Asylum who thinks they're a superhero? They sneak out of the infamous revolving door of Arkham Asylum at the end of every night, goes out and tries to be a superhero but fails spectacularly, thinks that his arch nemesis is a person named Brickbat and when all reality it's Batman, or if we really want to make this convoluted, we can make it like Hush and make it actually be the Riddler putting on a Batman cowl because he knows this dude's crazy. And at the end of every night, he sneaks back into his cell. That's genius. That would be a fucking great concept for a gag supervillain. Would you like to know how 7 Eleven's story ended? He was literally just shot by a racketeer. Th that's it. They gave his comic to somebody else. They literally just had one of his bad guys show up, kill him, and then they gave the book to a different superhero. <laughs> Again, great for a one-shot about a gag supervillain. I think this would be fucking brilliant. Part two to my last video, go and watch that. So I covered how many reboots Marvel has had. People have pointed out that I'm saying Secret War 2 when I actually meant Secret Wars in 2015. My apologies, my bad. However, the final two questions is, if Flashpoint and Crisis on Infinite Earths are DC's only reboots, then what was the new 52? And define reboot, essentially. So the New 52 thing is super easy. The New 52 was the marketing name for the re reboot after Flashpoint. Flashpoint was the reboot event. It was the event that rebooted the universe. The New 52 was the marketing tag that was put on books after that event. Any book that came out after the reboot was branded as the New 52, specifically because there was 52 books that came out. So the New 52 and Flashpoint are the same thing. The New 52 was just the result of Flashpoint. All right, we got it? Great. I am seeing so many people confused about the third question. So the original phrasing of the third question is DC does actually reboot small things with every single crisis. It's only had those big universal reboots twice. And in response to the last video about Marvel, people were calling like Secret Wars a reboot. So I feel like I should define universal reboot. When I am saying the universe was rebooted, I mean Everyone starts from number one, everyone's origins are reset, everybody basically has to retell who they are. I am talking like Flashpoint, like Crisis on Infinite Earths. Your history no longer exists and you are starting from scratch. A universal reboot as when the universe starts over. People do know these characters from their last iteration, but that last iteration isn't who they are anymore. The Bat Family pre and post Flashpoint are two different characters. Superman pre and post Flashpoint is two totally different people. That is a character who was completely rebooted. Pre-Crisis, Jason Todd was essentially a Dick Grayson clone. He was a redhead, he was a acrobat, he had the exact same origin as Dick Grayson, he was just a new version of Dick Grayson. But then after Crisis on Infinite Earths, he was rebooted, his character was changed, and he became the kid that we know today. That is a reboot. That is what happens when a universe reboots. Everybody starts from fucking scratch. We don't have to go back to their absolute first comic ever, but every character does have a different origin that is going to be revealed. After Crisis on Infinite Earths, Superman never was Superboy. After Flashpoint, Wally West was not Kid Flash. That is what I mean by universal reboot. So yes, DC has rebooted certain things in every single crisis, but in all reality, it's really reintroducing elements or taking elements away from the universe, not rebooting everything. I'm not saying a crisis does not have effects on the universe. I'm saying it doesn't start shit over. That was what I was saying. DC has only rebooted their universe. Everybody has been rebooted twice. Marvel debatably less than that. I think that makes sense. Tell me if it doesn't in the comments. <laughs> Tim! Yeah? I have been specifically asked by the homeowner to give you a pop quiz of your detective skills. Alright, there are a variety of things wrong with that sentence. First of all, his name is not the homeowner, it's Bruce. And second of all, how do you pop quiz detective skills? That, my inconsistently named friend, is for me to know and for you to soon find out. Are you ready? I'm literally still in my pajamas. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. 
You have 30 seconds. Find all the bits. Uh. Hey, Dick. Hey, Jay. Wait, go, what, go, stop, no. He's back in 45 degree angle. That means it has to be over here somewhere. Didn't you tell me you bought that at a yard sale? Estate sale, actually. Uh-huh. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> 10 seconds left! What, uh... What estate, exactly? Oh, you didn't hear? The, uh... Old theater closed down. The Gotham Theater? Yeah, they were selling off a whole bunch of old uh, props and stuff. Oh. Come on. <laughs> I got it! Oh, I got it! Good job, buddy. Hmm. That's mean. It's a good fucking test is what it is. <laughs> hey, why does this say property of Warner Brothers? Part two to my last video, go and watch that. So I covered how many reboots Marvel has had. People have pointed out that I'm saying Secret War 2 when I actually meant Secret Wars in 2015. My apologies, my bad. However, the final two questions is if Flashpoint and Crisis on Infinite Earths are DC's only reboots, then what was the new 52? And define reboot, essentially. So the New 52 thing is super easy. The New 52 was the marketing name for the reboot after Flashpoint. Flashpoint was the reboot event. It was the event that rebooted the universe. The New 52 was the marketing tag that was put on books after that event. Any book that came out after the reboot was branded as the New 52, specifically because there was 52 books that came out. So the New 52 and Flashpoint are the same thing. The New 52 is just the result of Flashpoint. All right, we got it? Great. I am seeing so many people confused about the third question. So the original phrasing of the third question is DC does actually reboot small things with every single crisis. It's only had those big universal reboots twice. And in response to the last video about Marvel, people were calling like Secret Wars a reboot. So I feel like I should define universal reboot. When I am saying the universe was rebooted, I mean Everyone starts from number one, everyone's origins are reset, everybody basically has to retell who they are. I am talking like Flashpoint, like Crisis on Infinite Earths. Your history no longer exists, and you are starting from scratch. A universal reboot is when the universe starts over. People do know these characters from their last iteration, but that last iteration isn't who they are anymore. The Bat Family pre and post Flashpoint are two different characters. Superman pre and post Flashpoint is two totally different people. That is a character who was completely rebooted. Pre-Crisis, Jason Todd was essentially a Dick Grayson clone. He was a redhead, he was a acrobat, he had the exact same origin as Dick Grayson, he was just a new version of Dick Grayson. But then after Crisis on Infinite Earths, he was rebooted, his character was changed, and he became the kid that we know today. That is a reboot. That is what happens when a universe reboots. Everybody starts from fucking scratch. We don't have to go back to their absolute first comic ever, but every character does have a different origin that is going to be revealed. After Crisis on Infinite Earths, Superman never was Superboy. After Flashpoint, Wally West was not Kid Flash. That is what I mean by universal reboot. So yes, DC has rebooted certain things in every single crisis, but in all reality, it's really reintroducing elements or taking elements away from the universe, not rebooting everything. I'm not saying a crisis does not have effects on the universe. I'm saying it doesn't start shit over. That was what I was saying. DC has only rebooted their universe. Everybody has been rebooted twice. Marvel debatably less than that. I think that makes sense. Tell me if it doesn't in the comments. I have a question for every single one of my followers, and no pressure, but your answer to this question will heavily determine my opinion of your opinion. Are you ready? I don't think you are. All right. The question is, what is your definitive Spider-Man eye shape? Do you like him a little thinner so it makes him look creepy? Or are you like me, where you like the thicker black outline around? Do you not exist and like the Todd McFarlane full face eyes? Are you simply wrong and like the John Romini Jr. trapezoids with eyebrows? Or perhaps you're a 2000s kid and for some reason like your Spider-Man eyes with a crack down the middle of them for no fucking reason. Or maybe you're a Toby fanboy and like yours a little angular. There are absolutely no wrong answers except for the objectively wrong answer. Stitch this, comment it, I wanna know.
it's not that big of a deal. It's a little bit of a big deal. It's a pretty fucking big deal. There's no secondary analysis that goes into this. I'm just genuinely curious. Today, I tried a new barber. My usual barber was normal for my last house. I drive like 45 minutes from where I am right now to get to him. And there's a barber shop that I know that is in a chain of barber shops that I've known about for a while that's like five minutes away from my house. So I decided I was gonna try them out today because I needed a haircut. I told the guy the exact same thing that I usually tell every single barber that I've ever had cut my hair. It's basically just a buzz cut on the sides, just cut down to the metal, then we're good. I assume that they think that's going to mean just take the, the extender off the top of your, of your buzzer and cut down to the metal and then stop. That's not what this guy heard. This guy heard, make the sides of my head fucking smooth. This man busted out the electric razor that you would use to like smooth your face out. Like usually I'm used to them using that on like the back of my neck. And that's how it was going until he put a straight stripe all the way from the back of my neck to like midway up my scalp and then just started fucking grinding it in. So I was, uh, I was already too far in. I couldn't stop this guy and be like, hey man, that's not... That's not how I do my hair. I just had to be like, okay, um, I, I guess this is my hair now. The sides of my scalp are so smooth right now, and I am not used to being straight up bald on the sides. My hairline is fucking gone. My Vegeta's peak that I usually have is just extended all the way up to the fucking line. My scalp is gonna break out so fucking bad in a couple of days. I promise you I started this video as uh, an intro to a regrettable superhero, um, but now this intro has gone on too long, so I'm just gonna do a regrettable superhero tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, uh, the mohawk is a lot smoother than it usually is. <laughs> and I made the mistake last time of making the entire video the intro to a regrettable superhero, so we're just gonna get into it. Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the week to now weekly show where I pick one character out random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run the fuck down. Except it's not gonna be random today because we're still working through the ones that I did at NogoCon. Luckily, there was only two, so today we are doing the second. That character being Morlock. 2001. Morlock is uh, Quicksilver in the corner here with the fucking Vegeta. Hair. And if you were wondering, yes, he is turning that man into a vegetable. No, I seriously mean a vegetable. Morlock 2001 was created by Michael Fleischer and Al Migram in Morlock 2001, number one of Atlas Comics in February of 1975. In the far off dystopian future of 2001, the brutally repressive world government is trying to manufacture super soldiers. But they're not trying to do it in the normal way of like spicing up regular humans no they're literally trying to grow them and morlock this guy is one of said super soldiers being grown from an eggplant morlock does not stick with the oppressive regime for long though almost immediately rebelling against his oppressive creators how does he do this you might ask well he also has the abilities of the hulk like down to the fucking letter he turns into a giant monster when you get him angry oh this giant monster actually did I mention that when he's in his monstrous form, he fucking eats people? Yeah, he doesn't really have a mind when he's like this. He just consumes and fights. This guy lasted a total of two issues, technically three, but at the third issue, he was given the subtitle of And the Midnight Men. And in that third issue, the aforementioned Midnight Man, leader of the Midnight Men, sees Morlock turning into his monstrous sate and as a mercy, shoots him in the fucking head. Boom, dead. He then blows up the ship that they're on because they were doing some, like, plot-relevant stuff with a bomb, seemingly killing the both of them. And then almost immediately afterward, uh, the comic company folded. So this dude's story j just kind of ends again. Ironically, by another superhero that was in the subtitle shooting him in the head. How did I get that both times? Anyway, I don't think anybody is surprised by this. I guess you could technically make this character interesting if you didn't end it there. Like have him be a side character in Commandi, the last boy on Earth or something. This poor genetically modified person that can transform into a giant monster that eats people, trying desperately to not do that. But let's be honest, it would just be like the Hulk, if that that's just the Hulk. I mean shit, Ultimate Hulk even fucking ate people. This is just this would just be like putting the ultimate Hulk in any comic. So yeah, sadly, this this, this is regrettable. I, I don't know what to do with it. This is an eggplant man that turns into the Hulk. I realized something kind of kind of weird. I wouldn't particularly say that it's a reoccurring thing, but it is something that has happened more than once. For those of you who've been watching for a little while, you know that me and Scarlet are currently watching through My Hero Academia. The main idea of My Hero Academia is that most of the world now has superpowers. People started to be born with them, and now 99% of the planet has superpowers. That's like the, the main backbone of the series. And watching that, I couldn't help but realize that it feels a little familiar. 
but it was being more optimistic than I was used to. And that's when I realized that's essentially the main idea of Kingdom Come, which is my favorite comic of all time. Given it's not most of the world, but there is a staggering number of people with superpowers, and some of them use them for evil, and some of them use it for good. And that is also the main idea behind the book that I'm reading for the comic book book club right now, Earth X. The main backbone for this story is that everyone on Earth has their mutant genes activated and how that changes the world. This book is essentially the, like, devastating few years that My Hero Academia talks about. In the show, the first couple of years where people had superpowers was apparently devastating. A lot of bad shit happened. A lot of people died. And this book takes place within that first couple of years and i find it so fascinating the different philosophies that these two series have on the same idea or virtually the same idea my hero academia for the most part feels like a pretty optimistic series the world isn't destroyed the world isn't in a complete state of disrepair because everybody has superpowers there's just some bad apples that that act as supervillains and then superheroes are deployed to stop them but in earth x Superheroes are essentially obsolete. Everyone can stop the bad guy, so why would heroes be needed? And the more that I think about it, without going into spoilers, because obviously I want you to watch the YouTube video, there is a villain in Earth X that operates in a very similar role to All for One. It very much feels like Earth X, as a book, is showing what those first few years of My Hero Academia would be like if it was set in the Marvel Universe. So hey, if you're a big My Hero Academia fan and you've been real, real curious about those like first devastating couple of years that they talk about briefly in, in the show and in the manga, go check out Earth X by Alex Ross and Jim Kruger because honestly, it, it operates in essentially the same way. That if The Flash was successful, DC was planning to make a Batman Beyond. So I'm going to say something that I know a lot of people are not going to agree with me on. I'm probably going to get a lot of shit in the comments for this opinion. But it's my truth and i got to say it. <sighs> Fuck Terry McGinnis. I ain't never once liked Batman Beyond. Batman Beyond is the most fucking pessimistic and lazy approach to the future of Batman, and I will say that with my whole chest. It's essentially what if we just made Batman Spider-Man 2099. In fact, it's so much like Spider-Man 2099 that Marvel canceled their 2099 show because Batman Beyond was too fucking similar. If you're ever wondering why Spider-Man Unlimited exists, that's why. Bruce Wayne has a minimum of five fucking Robins, and you're telling me that the person who takes up the mantle after him is some fucking kid who rolled up and got his ass beat by a gang? You're telling me not one of those five fucking descendants helped him out? Oh, but Panda, only Tim Drake and Dick Drayson exist in the Batman Beyond timeline. Wrong. Jason Todd and Damian Wayne have been introduced in the comic. And on top of that, why isn't Dick Grayson there? Tell me. I want you to explain that fucking story to me because it sucks. The only reason that Dick Grayson didn't pick up the mantle is because it's entirely predicated on that fucking weird ass Bruce Tim shit of Batman getting to with Barbara Gordon. The best story concerning Batman Beyond is Return of the Joker, which is entirely based on the bedrock of the weird ass Tim Drake, Jason Todd hybrid that the adventures of Batman and Robin created. Is that movie good? Yeah, it's a good little Elseworld story, but I have never understood the feverish love that Terry McGinnis has gotten. I have never understood the entire hype behind Batman Beyond. Terry feels like the perfect Batman clone OC that somebody threw together to be the next generation of Batman. What if he was like Batman, but younger and cockier and a lot of fun and sarcastic, but also he's the biological son of Batman, meaning that he's an absolute badass that everybody respects. I know people love this character, and I'm happy that you guys have them. Does it suck that a fan-favorite property will not be adapted because of the failure of another movie? Sure. But that's one of my biggest Batman hot takes that I have. I fucking hate Batman Beyond. I just think it is such a pessimistic look at Batman's mission. It feels like that sort of Batman 666 style universe. What if what Batman is doing never helps? Gotham in the future is just as corrupt, just as dark. Hell, it's even more dystopian because Batman's mission does nothing. It's a superhero story. I want at least a little bit more optimism than that. Also, you mean to tell me Batman. Bruce Wayne, Batman. Bruce, I would rather throw a batarang through the shoulder of my adopted son than use a gun, Batman. 
used a gun and that's why he quit? I feel the same way about that version of Batman that a lot of people do about Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi. That's not how Batman would act. He would not fucking do that. I don't know. That's my opinion. I know I'm in the huge minority here, but dude, I've just never gotten it. It's a funny story. What was in the 80s such a terrifyingly apocalyptic idea that it ended up being the twist ending of one of the most depressing superhero comics of all time that fundamentally changed the medium from the ground up is now in 2023 a relatable meme. God damn, inflation is a bitch, ain't it? Can you use the power of social media to answer a question for me? I so desperately want to know what was it like to be a Nightcrawler fan when X2 came out. X2 isn't the sequel to X-Men. Cause I know personally when I watch comic book movies, Scarlet calls me a bit of a canon purist. I disagree, but I can see your point. I get a little frustrated if something gets changed for seemingly no reason. If there's a good reason or it's to fit within the world that they're in, I don't really care. Or like if something in the original canon wasn't very good and they wanted to change it, then yeah, then I could see that. But if it's just changed to change something, not, not usually a big fan of that. Literally every adaptation of Miles Morales giving him an actual fucking personality, totally cool. Yes, I know he has a personality in the comics now. I'm talking like the early Ultimates comic. It, it was hard to find. The Eternals are androids now instead of altered humans because that makes more sense for mass production for multiple planets. Totally cool. Need to change the origin of a character because certain events didn't actually happen in this universe. That also is fine. And I know that like, good superhero movies were kind of in their infancy when X2 came out. It's still regarded as like one of the best, but I was only three when X-Men 2 came out, so I wasn't like a huge comic fan that, that was going to yell and scream about the canon. So if I went into the movie hearing that my favorite blue swashbuckling furball was going to be in it, it opens with the coolest fight that I could possibly describe to have this character in. But then they talk to him a little later and he's like super into scarification and way more religious than he's usually portrayed has maybe three or four lines tops with characters that are like his best friends in the comics i don't i don't know how i'd feel man and i mean honestly the same thing goes if i was a mystique fan this is what mystique looks like in the comics she's just blue and honestly for the most part does not give a fuck about magneto the name magneto doesn't even appear on her wiki page until like a quarter of the way down i just gotta know what was it like being a superhero fan in the early 2000s? Not because I think that you would hate the movies. I know people love the movies. I love the movies. But I gotta know what it was like just kind of swallowing that part of yourself that was like, Ugh, that's not, that's not right, but okay, fine. Tell you for weeks I was trying to find these Bluetooth microphones that I knew that I had because I know that my phone case fucks my audio quality. Anyway, this video is specifically for the people that watch the Comic Book Book Club. If you do not watch the Comic Book Book Club, what the hell are you watching me on here for? My content on there is so much better. Anyway, for anybody who does watch the Comic Book Book Club, you know that I have a very specific... Th th there's a way that my videos... Usually about halfway through the video, I do a full-scale, full-spoiler plot recap of the book that I'm covering. You would also know that this month I'm covering Earth X by Marvel Comics. So I was writing my synopsis as I usually usually takes about a day to like fully reread through the book and write down all of the plot relevant information. But Earth X is weird, man. Half the story is told through flashbacks and shit that happens before the book even opens. If you think I'm exaggerating, read it. Most of the story is told through flashbacks. If you look at the wiki for the actual like book itself, most of the information given happens before the story even opens. And the story itself only takes up like, I don't know, two, three paragraphs, maybe? Anyway, I was running into the problem that I was trying to explain everything that happens before the story so then I can actually, you know, get into the story. And that synopsis ended up being, I shit you not, 10 pages long on its own. I just viewed my footage and realized this microphone cuts off at the back syllable of every sentence that I say, and that is going to be so aggravating in the edit. So anyway, here is my solution that I am proposing today. I think I'm going to make a lore breakdown video ahead of the comic book book club video. Sort of a explanation of the world specifically for Earth X, so that the video that I end up making isn't three fucking hours long with an hour and a half of it being explaining shit that happens before the book even opens. So congratulations everybody that engages with my content outside of TikTok. You're gonna be getting two videos this month. Three, four, 
four videos this month. I make two CBBCs a month and then one compilation. So four. You're going to be getting four videos this month. However, that first video will be required reading for the second video. So I'm, I'm sorry for giving y'all homework. All right, I'm going back inside. I got fucking work to do. You ever stop to consider how weird, like, pop culture must be inside of a comic book universe? Movies, video games, media in general will be completely altered with the absence of superheroes from pop culture. Because comic books and comic book superheroes are used as sort of like an escapist medium. So if it's no longer an escapist medium, if it is all of a sudden that's just the news, that's just reality outside your fucking door, it is fundamentally going to change how pop culture works in that world. Case in point, let's look at the original Star Wars. Star Wars gives us one of the most terrifying movie villains of all time, being Darth Vader. This dark, terrifying, cloaked figure that will hunt you down to the end of the fucking galaxy and take you the hell out with his dark wizardry. Yeah, you want to know who he's partially based on? Dr. Victor Von fucking Doom. So let's think about this from the context of the Marvel Universe, right? If Star Wars exists, it's fundamentally different than it is in our universe. Because if Darth Vader is based on Victor Von Doom in the Marvel Universe, that means that he would be based off of a active, reigning world leader who has shown the capability and willingness to attack American soil at any given time. Yeah, movies like The Interview exist where they like riff on Kim Jong-un and everything, right? But like... That's not like the palatable, safe family entertainment like Star Wars is. Star Wars has always had really deep political themes, but it's not going to base one of its world leaders off of a active current world leader with all of the fucking trapping. I mean, it has in the past, but it's like tucked it under the rug. You understand what I'm saying here. Pop culture is different if this character exists in a comic book universe. Like it's confirmed that DC Comics exists within Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics exists within Marvel Comics. But it's kind of hinted that that comic book universe is like the comic book universe in their opposing universe. There's no big two in Marvel and DC. There's just Marvel for DC or DC for Marvel. Because if comic books exist that tell the stories of Marvel or DC in Marvel or DC, that essentially just makes them historical pamphlets. Dramatized history like they talk about in like Logan. I'm understanding that this is sounding very confusing the more that I say it. My main point is this. Pop culture is fundamentally different within a comic book universe if you remove the influence of comic books from the pop culture in that universe. Things might still exist, but they will be fundamentally unrecognizable based on the changes that would come if you remove the superhero and comic book influences from these movies and TV shows. Maybe the explanation would work better if I use an example. Mortal Kombat, the video game series, started its life as a adaptation of Bloodsport. The Jean-Claude Van Damme movie it was going to be an adaptation of that movie. Or like a licensed video game where you get to play as a character. But then the license was pulled away at the last second and Mortal Kombat was developed from its bones. Hence we get Mortal Kombat as a series which is now a pop culture icon. Bloodsport doesn't exist, Mortal Kombat doesn't exist, Mortal Kombat doesn't enter the pop culture sphere, or if it is created it's based on something entirely different. Fundamentally changing its formula. Now imagine if that happens if you remove every Marvel comic from media. I'm just saying, it's crazy to think about. And that is going to be it for this month. I just want to take a moment to thank all of my lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. Amanda Barnstead, Andrea Lanowitz, Bill Bro, Brandon Bilbrey, Brian Van Vorst, Carol Cowett, Christopher Bosgard, Danny Walker, Dark Nimbus, Devin Iculus, Dee Dee, Dominic Vaculo, Dragon Fang, Elizabeth Rush, Fireball Sensei, Gas Boss Gatelight Girl Keep, Have a Heart Tin Man, Jacob Safel, Jeffrey Aviles, Jeremy Strickland, Joshua Kraft, Caitlin Norman, Cat Q, Kathy Coker, Katie Hawkins, Kieran Wheeler, Magu, Max Baker, Nixie Shimo, Pandora A, Pinchy Mugre, Raymond Villasana, Righteous Duke, Ricky Tiki Davi, Samuel Adams, Tangled Web, The Brain Teaser, The Holy Corota, Thomas Randolph, Toy Box, T.S. Famder, Tyler Ellis, and Wofu Badge 2, as well as all of my other lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. And if you too would like your name read out at the end of every single YouTube video I do on this channel, as well as having the ability to vote on new episodes of the Comic Book Book Club as they come out, feel free to hop on over to my Patreon and donate at least $15 or more. Or hey, if that's not an option, even a dollar helps. Believe it or not, I am indeed still working on the Earth X videos. It is now two videos that I have to make, the first of which being a real just explanation of the world because it's so confusing, and the second one being the actual comic book book club video. Uh, I'm planning to have those out very soon. I'm working very hard on them. I got kind of sidetracked on a different project that I am going to make public very soon, 
as well, but I'm sorry that it's taking a little bit longer. Thank you guys for being so patient with me. I know that this is a very consistent thing that I have problems with uh, scheduling. So I am trying to, to make it better. So I'm gonna try and get these videos out as soon as possible. I'm working on the first of two right now uh, and I'm planning on having it out pretty soon. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for sticking around. Thank you guys for being so patient. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's video. So I will see you guys next time.